If you're having issues with making a large painting or don't know where to start, you're risking a lot of your time if you don't have a plan. Today, we're going to take an idea and put it on a big canvas. I'm going to demonstrate the process with a recent painting and give you the steps to execute your vision. We're going to go from here to here. And I'm going to show you the steps and the thought processes in between. I'm Roy, and I want to help you tell your story through painting. So let's go. Step one, reference material. I'm going to assume you already have something in mind. But if not, I made a video on how to change the lighting for reference photos up here, if you'd like to see it. You're going to want to grid it out to make things easy on yourself. You can also print out the image and use a ruler and take a Sharpie over it. Draw that same grid on your canvas. You will need it going forward. It is also at this point you're going to want to know what your painting is about. Make it clear in your mind and write it down. What exactly is it that I want to say with this painting? Use what you wrote down to keep on track if you ever waver or get lost. I wanted to show that foreground tree and shrub and shadow, looking out over the beauty of the landscape. Step 2. Masses. You are going to want to block in the big masses as accurately as you can to the reference material, or if you altered the reference to the idea that you have. Keep this layer thin so you can continue to paint over it as you go. You are going to make mistakes and not get things perfect. That's to be expected. Don't expect more of yourself than that. You will see me take one big shape that is out of line, or at least not where I would like it to be, and change it. Keep an eye out for anything large that doesn't set well in its surroundings. Step back often and it will be easier to see this. Also, be sure to use the grid when you are doing this. Don't get wild and go off script. Keep referencing where shapes cross the grid lines. Also check your angles against the straight verticals and horizontals, it will help with accuracy. Step 3. Secondary Shapes Here we are going a level lower from those masses into the secondary shapes. Now you are looking at the light and shadow patterns of all the trees, the hill, the foreground plain, the shrubs and grasses, even the clouds. Because you kept your initial layer thin, you should still be able to see and use your grid, and I really hope you did, otherwise you need to wipe it back a little. At this phase, it's important to have that grid to rely on, especially if you are having a hard time getting accurate drawings. Don't be afraid to go past the edges of your initial mass lay-in. I told you it was okay to make mistakes and this is why. You are going to paint and draw over top of it anyway. That is why you should be confident in the marks that you make. It will make a big difference in how the painting looks. Nobody looks at a painting with all and says, I love it. Look at the timid brush strokes. They say, oh, look how confident these marks are. Step 4. Look into the shadows. Work out the shadows, or the dark shapes if you don't have a strong light and shadow pattern. Most of the time, I will go darkest shadows to the lightest shadows. In this painting, there's a lot of depth between the foreground, midground, and background hills. Keep that in mind as you are laying in your shadow color. The value is going to get lighter as it recedes. There is also the option, and this one applies to both light and shadow, that everything fades towards the middle value as it goes back. That idea ensures that the contrast lowers the further back you go. You have to choose which one you want for any given painting. Here I have three distinct value groups within the shadows. The deep shadows that are up under the trees and some of the shrubs, the tops of the foliage on trees, shrubs, and grasses, and the exposed surface up in the foreground. Within each of these value groups, things will slide a little depending on how close or far back you go. The foliage tops are going to stay fairly close in value, and the main difference being how much it shifts in color. You need to think ahead and realize that the exposed ground is going to reflect a little bit of the sky color, so I shifted things in that direction as much as I possibly could. When you are doing your painting, realize that all the shadows that are not deep dark recesses are going to have some of that sky reflected in them. I went front to back with my shadows on this painting. You can go back to front or jump around. That is something you can play around with. A lot of artists will go in many different directions. The more you play around with that idea of how you're going to lay in your shadows is going to determine what your paintings eventually tend to look like. If you go back to front, one thing to keep in mind is you're going to need to wipe out some of those shadow areas as you put shapes on top of them. If you have a really dark, dark, and then you want to put something light on top of it. That will work if the dark is very thin and that light is very thick. But if you get 
any kind of thickness to those darks, you're going to need to wipe them back. So just keep that in mind and do your best to not muddy up that light color. Step five, let there be light. Once you had the shadows down, go into the lights and correct any big value issues first. Those mid-ground trees were a little too light for my taste. They were dropped back down towards the middle value. Then over time, I built them back up into the lighter values in the planes that are facing towards the sun. It helps me to think of them as chunks of clay. I will either put on or I will carve off large planes from the tree. Later, you can dress it up and put a little texture at the edge of those planes if you want, or you can just leave them chunky and call it good. Now this is a scene from Brown County, Indiana. It was once a great American art colony in the early 1900s. I paint here a lot and it's stunningly beautiful. It has rolling hills and pockets of fields down in hollers that were cleared out a long, long time ago. This scene always stops me and I find myself here often. On this particular day, it put me in awe as the clouds drifted past and put different layers of the landscape in shadow. It was as if they just decided to suddenly change their colors to blue. My dog Holly is out there with me quite a bit, and when I saw that foreground tree and shrub and shadow, it made me think of us just standing there, completely surrounded by all that beauty. The shade moved as the wind carried off the clouds. That back hill kept wavering between light and shadow. It struck me and stayed with me on the drive home. When I got back, I played around with the original reference photo. Thinking about that changing light was a catalyst for this image. Back into the lights, work out your sky. If you have clouds, typically they're going to have some of the lightest colors. Try and start with parts of the cloud that are lit up by the sun. And if there isn't any, those planes that are facing up. Then look at the shadows or cloud bottoms. It's a lot easier to carve into the cloud with the sky color than it is to paint lighter over top of all that saturated blue. Now you may think, why are those cloud shadows not included in the shadow step? That's a good question. On average, cloud shadows are still fairly high in value compared to the ground. There are instances where that's not the case, and if you run into that, change what you're doing according to the needs of the painting. But this is a good place for you to get started though. Here I'm going to go back and finish an area that I glanced over. It's easy to miss things when you're painting big, even when it's right under your nose. I miss the shrubs on the side of the hill. You should always be scanning the image for any large oversights you may have committed. It's easier to perform this when stepping back from the image. The smaller the painting is in your field of view, the easier it is to read in a single glance. If your eye has to move over the painting section by section, you're relying on your memory to stitch together everything in your mind, and it's not the easiest thing to do. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you should strive to make things flow as easily as you can taking advantage of anything that can help you in the process. Step six, refine and finish. Continue to refine what you've been doing. We're gonna put these last two together because I don't wanna drag things out on you. Here you're going to wanna to push and pull values and shapes a little bit further, but there comes a point where you have to decide that things are good enough. You have to settle the big shapes and the light and shadow patterns have to be set. If this is your first time or you're not comfortable with painting large, let go of being perfect and settle on good enough. This is a long game and finishing this one will get you in the next phase of your journey. Once you get that settled, you're going to want to put on those finishing touches. I have a few things that I look for at the end and it usually stems from a question like this. Think back to those first big shapes that you put in. What could you do to make them appear as if one is sitting in front of or behind another? Look at the edge of them and start thinking about using color to do that. You will see me add a bridge color on the edge of these large masses that can indicate any number of things. What I would ask you to do is mix up some colors that are close to your mass and then shift them towards one of the primary or secondary colors. Play around with seeing what they will do when you put that on the edge. Then I would try to gradate that color into the next shape over. And that's where you'll find something beautiful. Remember to start with a good idea. Initially paint thin, don't tighten up yet because you're gonna paint over it. Block things in, shadow then lights. 
Then we refine and finish up. If you're having any problems with your work and there's something you would like me to cover, let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to help. If you would like a print of this painting, there's a link below. And if you're not quite ready to tackle it yet, here's a video that will help you on your way as you try to create larger work. Until next time, keep painting.